Hi, my name is Jürgen Rockstrow, and it's really a true pleasure to speak to you today on caring for patients with HIV and hepatitis B and C co-infection. These are my conflict of interests. Now let's start with hepatitis B. I'm sure you're very familiar with the global status of HPV infection, and really it's a large number of 257 million people living worldwide with chronic HPV infection. The majority, 68% in African and Western Pacific regions, but obviously a really common finding in Asia. Now, 7% of persons with HIV also have hepatitis B co-infection, which explains why we have to screen everyone upon a first visit when he presents to an HIV clinic also for hepatitis B. Of note, one of the very few successes is that the proportion of children younger than five years of age with chronic HPV has decreased from 4.7% during the pre-vaccine era to less than 1.3% in 2016. So global role of vaccine is preventing more and more hepatitis B infections, and that is really positive news. Now, last year, there was a paper which performed a systemic review and meta-analysis of studies published in China on the prevalence of hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and both of the viral hepatitis together. And you can see that indeed, um, the prevalence of chronic hepatitis B in HIV patients has remained very high in China, 13.4% before 2010, but still even higher with 14.7% uh, between 2010 and 2019. So it's an ongoing remaining issue and underlines the importance of chronic hepatitis B and HIV co-infection, and it's independent from geographic region, somewhat higher and older patients, uh, and uh, but otherwise uh, pretty much found in all HIV infected individuals. Now, why is hepatitis B clinically so relevant? Well, there has been work which has demonstrated that in the setting of HIV, hepatitis B takes a more unfavorable course and the mortality due to liver disease is enhanced in patients with HIV. So clearly having hepatitis B means you're gonna have a more progressive fibrosis progression, high risk for cirrhosis, uh, unless you receive appropriate treatment. Now, fortunately, in the last years and decades, various nucleoside and nucleotides with anti-HPV activity have been introduced and all of them seem to work pretty well. But some of them, particularly the first ones, which were very successful though in improving the outcome of hepatitis D, uh, like lamivudine, uh, are associated with a high rate of resistance development over time, which is even higher in patients with HIV co-infection. You can see here that the resistance rate uh, is pretty high uh, with 70%. So clearly these agents cannot be used as monotherapy anymore. And you can see that in contrast, entecavir and tenofovir are hardly, if at all, associated with resistance development and have therefore become the preferred agents. Now, obviously, in the setting of treatment of hepatitis B and HIV, remember that tenofovir has dual activity against HIV and hepatitis B, and as such, is therefore the first-line recommended drug to be used in patients who have HIV and HPV co-infection. Actually, stopping of anti-HPV-active ART should be avoided because of the high risk of severe hepatis, hepatitis flares and decompensation following reactivation. Now, the optimal duration of nucleoside therapy has not yet really been determined. Uh, and in the setting of HIV, which also requires lifelong therapy, probably lifelong therapy is the best. Uh, but there are patients who develop seroconversion. So at least if you, for example, think of switching a patient to long-acting therapy, which has no anti-HPV activity, you could do that if seroconversion has occurred. Obviously, in patients with liver cirrhosis, you would be very careful because you do clearly don't want to have reactivation and want to avoid liver decompensation. For the monitoring, it's important to regularly determine liver blood tests, but also perform an HPV DNA analysis um, after the first year every 12 months, and also check HBS antigen regularly because of the potential loss of HBS antigen. Now, remember, when you start someone with it's an your based regimen in the setting of HIV, HPV co-infection. The hallmark of hepatitis B in HIV is usually that you have relatively low elevated liver enzymes or even normal liver enzymes, but you have a very high baseline viral load. And indeed, because of that very 
high baseline viral load. It can take quite some time before complete suppression of HPV DNA is reached. And you can see here in an analysis from the US that indeed patients with a high baseline viral load above eight log, that quite a number, probably half of the patients are still having HPV DNA detectable after one year of a tenofovir-based regimen. So that I think is an issue. But obviously, keep in mind, it can take time and they eventually will become negative. I think one of the more pending research questions though is, is this time of detectable uh, HPV DNA associated with a higher risk for HCC development? Because we do know that viremia is a driver of HCC occurrence. Now note that one special thing about treatment of hepatitis B and HIV patients is that patients have a higher risk of chronification if they get infected while they're already HIV positive. So you're HIV positive, get an acute hepatitis B, then you are six times more likely to develop chronic infection. That means that patients potentially would have lost their hepatitis B or cleared infection or controlled infection if they would not have had HIV associated immunodeficiency. So if you start HIV, HPV dual active therapy, and there's an immune reconstitution of the immune system, then actually some patients will become capable of eliminating hepatitis B and actually HBS antigen seroconversion may occur. This is a very rare event, usually under nucleoside or nucleotide treatment, but it does happen here in a large German cohort in 18.4%. At this year, CROI just happening while I'm speaking, uh, there is a Swiss cohort which shows 16.4% HPS antigen loss. So this is really more common and that's important because if you want to switch to a tenofovir free regimen, obviously you could do that if the patient has developed anti-HPS. Remember that if you are giving someone a tenofovir based regimen in the setting of not having any sign of a prior HPV infection and no vaccination, it is protective against acquiring hepatitis B. And you see this from a Dutch court analysis where patients who had no vaccination and negative hepatitis B serology did not acquire hepatitis B when they were on a tenofovir regimen, whereas there were individuals who acquired an acute hepatitis B while being on an ART regimen not containing tenofovir. So remember, tenofovir also protects against acquisition of hepatitis B. Now, one important thing of hepatitis B is that you are at increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So screening is indicated in all persons who are co-infected with HIV and HPV, also in hepatitis C co-infected individuals who have cirrhosis. And then uh, for those who have no cirrhosis, then follow the easel guidelines where the PHB score is recommended to assess risk. There's a calculator which you can use, which takes into account age, gender, and platelets. Risk factors for HCC in patients with co-infection is family history of HCC, Asian or African ethnicity, so that applies also to the Chinese patients, Delta co-infection and higher age. The guidelines recommend screening by ultrasound every six months, and you can do that with or without AFP measurement. Just one word to hepatitis D, because I think that's something we often tend to forget, that in the presence of chronic HBS antigen production, you can develop a Delta super infection. And this is recent data from Taiwan, uh, again from Croy, uh, March 21. And you see they screened all their patients which attended the University Hospital in Taiwan. And of the 505 individuals who had HBS antigen positivity, they identified 8%, which were 41 with recent hepatitis Delta infection. So it's clearly important to also remember to check at least once for Delta infection. Let's move to hepatitis C. So of the 7, 37 million HIV infected, we estimate that at least 2.3 million also have hepatitis C. The infections are enriched, particularly in patients who have, H, uh, who have intravenous drug use as a risk factor for HIV transmission. You can see that more than 80% of drug users also have hepatitis C, but also remember there has been an outbreak of acute hepatitis C in men who have sex with men more recently, also in various Asian countries. So that's something also to consider. Now, from European court data, we know very well that progression of liver disease is accelerated. So just like in hepatitis B, in the setting of HIV, particularly with more pronounced immune deficiency, you have faster fibrosis progression and a higher risk for cirrhosis development. You see here that if you have positive hepatitis C antibodies, your risk of dying from liver 
disease is nine times higher and it gets even higher if you're still replicating for hepatitis C. Now, obviously, if that's true, and if immunodeficiency plays a role in driving further fibrosis progression, you would at least speculate that initiation of HIV therapy and immune reconstitution could prevent that unfavorable fibrosis progression. And that's what we showed in a paper many years ago in The Lancet, where patients who received highly active antiviral therapy were much less likely to die from liver-related disease as causes in the setting of hepatitis C co-infection. So keeping CD4 count up is protective and slows down fibrosis progression. This is true, but even in the setting of controlled patients with HIV therapy, you can see here from the veterans court that patients who are co-infected still remain at a somewhat higher risk for hepatic decompensation, but note that the risk is highest if the CD4 comes below 200 uh, and you are not controlled uh, HIV RNA-wise with a viral load above 1,000. So really the patients who benefit the most who have good immune reconstitution and are well controlled for HIV replication, that's not the case, then you still have a higher risk for fibrosis progression. The treatment guidelines from EX, the European AIDS Clinical Society, clearly state that every person with HIV and hepatitis C co-infection should be considered for hepatitis C therapy, interferon, and preferably ribavirin-free with direct acting antiviral combinations, which should take into account um, uh, the, the different uh, regimens which are available. Remember that the Cure rates and tolerability in co-infected patients are very similar to mono-infected patients, and that's why treatment indication regimens are really the same as in hepatitis C mono-infection. You see here the table from the guidelines from last year, which sums up all the different regimens which are available for the different genotypes and the different durations, also taking into account whether the patient is non-serotic or has compensated cirrhosis. Remember that not all drugs can be used in the setting of more advanced cirrhosis, in particular hepatitis C protease inhibitors are usually then contraindicated. Nowadays though, there is a shift towards using mostly pangenotypic regimens, so it's really mostly soft vel or uh, the Glucapabir, Pepentosphere combinations because they work for all genotypes uh, and they have become the preferred regimens. One important thing to remember is that if you are an HIV patient, you're also taking HIV medications and there is a risk for drug-drug interactions between hepatitis C and HIV drugs. So check that with one of the commonly available drug interaction sites. The best one is probably the one from Liverpool. Here's a table which summarizes the drug interactions between DAs and ARVs. And you can see there are quite some interactions, particularly between hepatitis C protease inhibitors and HIV protease inhibitors. But if you are on a integrase inhibitor-based regimen, usually you're fine and there is no need for dose adaptation. Just showing you as I highlight some of the results from some of the pangenotypic regimens, this is Sovel for 12 weeks. And note that this was used in treatment naive and experienced patients, so those who failed prior interferon-based regimens. It was uh, also used in non-serotic and serotic patients, so more advanced fibrosis stages. And you can see independently of cirrhosis stage, independently of treatment history, all patients respond very well. And that's the beauty of DA therapy, simple regimens, 12 weeks, all oral, uh, and very high SVR rates defined as a negative hepatitis C PCR 24 weeks after stopping therapy. And the same holds true for the Exhibition 2 study. This was a study which used the uh, AVI combination or GP, and you can see that with eight or 12 weeks, excellent response rates were observed. There was only one patient was actually from our clinic with a genotype three infection who had on treatment virological failure, but this was also a patient with alcohol abuse and compliance issues, which may explain the breakthrough. All other patients achieved SVR. And what makes hepatitis C therapy so wonderful in clinic is that the tolerability is just so different than in the old days with interferon-based regimens. You see a table summarizing adverse events through commonly used DA regimens and co-infection trials, and you can see that the discontinuation rate because of adverse events is really low, underlying the high tolerability of these regimen. And so really in clinic, adverse events are not really a big concern other than maybe a little bit of headache 
uh, in the different uh, regimens used. I'd like to close with an algorithm for management of recently acquired hepatitis C infection, as we're seeing outbreaks more and more, particularly in MSM, but also among IV drug users when they share needles. Uh, so for public health reasons, in order to prevent further transmission, it has become very important to diagnose recently acquired hepatitis C fast. And then once you've done your first hepatitis C RNA quantitatively, if you repeat that four weeks later, there's not a too long drop, this patient is not gonna clear infection. Note that in the setting of HIV infection, clearance of hepatitis C spontaneously only occurs in up to 15% of patients. So it's not a highly uh, probable event. And if that too long drop doesn't occur, it's almost 100% sure that the patient will go on to develop chronic hepatitis C. And that is probably the best time to intervene and treat early in order to prevent further onward transmission. And I'd like to close with a final picture from Croy again. This is a presentation from the large uh, Spanish HIV hepatitis C co-infection court. So they take a fraction of their court and then try to demonstrate how the prevalence of hepatitis C infection has changed. And you can see that now in 2019 with the introduction and wide availability of DA therapies, they only have 2.2% of patients left who are still replicating, although you still have a high amount of patients who have hepatitis C antibodies, which tells you that they almost are reaching complete microelimination. This is probably best in some of the MSM risk groups because they're just easier to treat. Some of the IV drug users just don't present regularly for care. Um, but you can see that high treatment uptake has really paved the way for achieving microelimination in Spain, which I think tells you that this is really achievable. So in summary, we have a significant reduction in liver-related mortality in HIV, HPV co-infection with HPV active heart. Clearly, a tenofovir-based ART is the way to go, which should be started at any CD4 count. Remember that the time to undetectability, HIV, HPV viral load-wise can take more than a year, particularly if the baseline viral load is very high. Uh, check regularly for HBS antigen because 18% of the co-infected patients may lose HBS antigen. And if you're talking of treatment simplification or long-acting regimens, this may be important. In patients who do not respond to hepatitis B vaccination, tenofovir containing ART can prevent new incident HPV infection. Remember that in patients with chronic hepatitis B, you are at risk for having a hepatitis delta superinfection. So that should be checked for in anyone who has chronic HPV infection. Every person with HIV and hepatitis C co-infection clearly should be a candidate for DAA-based therapy. Microelimination is achievable in this group of patients. The regimens you use are the same as in hepatitis C mono-infection, but remember you have to check for drug-drug interactions between HIV and hepatitis C drugs. And with that, I'll send you a friendly hello from the Bond group. This is our research and clinical group uh, and hope you have some questions. Thank you very much for listening in.